service, the first song we're going to sing is Alleluia, Sing to Jesus. with my whole heart. I will tell of your, all your marvelous works. As Christians, we have the blessed hope of Christ soon return. Please join us in heartily singing, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Rejoice ye pure in heart. Rejoice, give thanks and sing your festival theme song hover o'er me holy spirit
Welcome to Devotion Time. We have an amazing speaker with us all the way from Australia this morning. An amazing and powerful servant of the Lord. Sharissa, I would like to pray for you this morning. It's okay. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful morning that we were able to wake up to. We just thank you for being here. Thank you so much for bringing us all safely to GYC that we can praise your holy name. I just want to lift up Sharissa straight to your throne this morning. May you anoint her lips. May her words be your words. May you empty us all of self, and may you fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' holy, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many of you here so early this morning for our morning devotion. Uh, before we go any further, I'd just like to offer a word of prayer just so that I can ask God to personally bless me as well. And I thank uh, her for her prayer. Let's just pray once more. Father in heaven, I just ask that um, in addition to the prayer that has been prayed, that you would take over this morning. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. May you take this message and apply it to each and every one of us individually, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Without a doubt, Steve Jobs was unquestionably the Thomas Edison of our times and one of the greatest visionaries that our world has ever seen. And when he passed away in October of this year, I thought it was very fitting that your president here in America, Obama, he said there is no greater tribute to Steve's success than the fact that much of the world learned of his passing on a device that he created. And Steve being the ultimate showman, at 18 of his product launches, he knew the power of an encore. And when he would come out dressed in his typical jeans and black turtleneck top, and he would introduce to the world Apple's latest market item, he would finish introducing the product, and everybody would break into applause, and he would turn and be about to walk off the stage, when suddenly he would stop, turn around and say, oh, and there's one more thing. And it would be at that moment that he would then unveil yet one more feature, one more exciting feature of the product that his audience was already thrilling over. And friends, in a similar sense, after Jesus had spent three and a half years training and teaching his disciples, after he commanded them to go into all the world and baptize people and to teach them of him, he also added one more thing to his commission, and we find it in the book of Luke, chapter 24 and verse 49. Come with me to the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 49. Luke, chapter 24, and we read it in verse 49. Luke, chapter 24, verse 49. Jesus says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Now, friends, let's not miss this. The same one who commanded them to go into all the world also ordered them to stay and wait. 
however long it took until they received power from the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine how they must have felt when Jesus said this to them? I mean, he had just told them to go, and they must have thought, how can we wait when there is a world to tell, and the world is incidentally quite large? But friends, Jesus had good reason for his instruction. He always does. You see, Jesus knew that unless they tarried, unless they waited for the Holy Spirit's power, they were destined to failure, and here's why. We read about it. Come with me to our theme story this morning, the book of Mark, Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, and our devotion this morning will begin in verse 14. Mark chapter 9, verse 14. It says, And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them. This is Jesus. He saw a great multitude around the disciples and scribes disputing with them. Now, friends, as you read the Gospels, you very quickly notice that crowds seem to follow Jesus like his own shadow. Everywhere Jesus is, there's a crowd there. But, friends, the crowd on this particular morning was different. Nine of the twelve disciples were locked in a theological debate with some scribes and an audience was standing around watching them ringside like it was a prime time TV show. A man had come to Jesus that morning looking for him to heal his son. I imagine it wasn't the first time that this father had gone looking for help. No doubt he had seen all the greatest physicians in Jerusalem only to be finally told by one perplexed doctor, look, I think your son's case is a serious case of demon possession, and there was no medicine for possession. He was privately destroyed by this news. He stopped going to church, and nobody seemed to notice. In fact, nobody seemed to mind. He started to question the existence of God. How could a loving God allow this to happen to his precious son? He believed that nothing was possible until one day somebody said something about Jesus. And the Bible doesn't tell us who it was. Maybe it was a young person. We don't know. Maybe a friend in Gennesaret emailed through something about how Jesus had cast out the demons from those two wild men who lived in the graveyard along the coast. Or maybe he'd been reading the reports in the papers about how the disciples were casting out demons in Jesus' name. In any case, this father had put off coming to Jesus perhaps because of something he read on some website, something about how Jesus was possessed with Beelzebub or something like that. But as the attacks on his son continued and grew worse, he decided that he had to try Jesus. And so he did. He went looking for him that morning and he took his son along. But when he found his disciples... They told him that Jesus was up a mountain with Peter, James, and John, and none of them knew when he was going to be back. And so, forced to do the next best thing, he turns to his disciples and he asks them if they can help him. And in my mind's eye, I can see them all looking at each other. Matthew glances at Philip and he just nods. They all look at Thomas and he shrugs his shoulders and says, well... We've done this before. I mean, remember when Jesus sent us out two by two to preach, heal, and cast out demons? We were always outnumbered then, but now look, there are nine of us and just one demon-possessed boy. How hard can this be? And so the exorcism began. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how they went about it, but whatever they did, it didn't work. And then to add insult to injury, some scribes happened to chance upon the scene. And as they watched the disciples fail, not just once or twice, but over and over and over again, the smirks on their faces grew larger and larger until soon, unable to contain themselves, 
they broke into a loud chorus of mocking laughter. Oh, what a joke! This is going to be a YouTube sensation. Behold, the mighty disciples of Jesus. Is this demon too powerful for you? Embarrassed and crestfallen, the confused disciples just stood there helplessly, looking at the scribes and the crowd and the boy writhing in agony at their feet. But nothing could bring them to face the Father. Then a scribe said something sharp. A disciple retaliated. A debate began and soon tempers were flaring. The man and his son lost in the controversy. And friends, sometimes it's easy for you and I to get caught up in defending the truth to scribes, to people who don't actually care about the truth anyway. Get it right and they'll criticize you. Get it wrong and they'll still criticize you. Jesus was never impressed with the scribes. Do you remember what he said of them? He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. They were part of the crowd who condemned Christ to death on the cross and then rushed home to keep the Sabbath. So friends, don't pay attention to the scribes. Pay attention to the ones who are hurting and searching and looking for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Verse 15. Immediately when they saw him, that's the crowd, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him, and he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Everyone was relieved to see Jesus show up because if there was anybody who could sort out this situation, well, Jesus could. And as soon as Jesus arrived, he saw the defeated expressions on his disciples' faces and he knew something was up. And so he turns to the scribes and he asks them to explain this situation. But if you notice in the text, his question, they answered with silence. And sometimes silence says quite a lot, doesn't it? I remember one day I got home, I walked down the steps in my backyard, and when I got downstairs in my backyard, everywhere as far as I could see was this foam strewn all over, ripped up foam. It was all over our backyard. And there, sitting in the middle of it all, was my dog, my puppy dog. His name was Texas. He was, <laughs> yeah, well, there you go, amen. Yes, his name was Texas. He was a miniature toy poodle. <laughs> I know this is the biggest state, but he was a very beautiful dog. He had a heart as big as Texas. And there he was. He was just sitting in the middle of all of this foam in the backyard. And I just looked at him, and I said, did you do this? And of course, he didn't answer me. But the ears went down, the head went down, the tail went down, and he looked back at me with eyes that said it all. And when I think about the scribes, I'm thinking about my dog too, because the scribes had encountered Jesus enough before to know that they probably shouldn't open their mouths too quickly now. And the disciples, though relieved that Jesus was back now, they were in no rush to report their failure either. And so the silence in this moment began to grow louder and louder until suddenly a breaking voice was heard. Verse 17. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid, so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. This man had been just about to walk away from that crowd when Jesus showed up. Matthew's Gospel tells us that he presses through the crowd and he falls on his knees before Jesus as he says these words. His eyes were red from the private tears that he'd been shedding. His story was one that would melt and elicit pity from the hardest of hearts. His only son, the Bible tells us in Luke's Gospel, his only son was being tormented by a demon. 
He was living an aquarium-like existence where, being mute and deaf, he could see what was happening around him, but he was unable to respond to what was happening. He pictures, if you like, the plight of our planet, filled with pain and suffering, but powerless to do anything about it. But friends, it was the last words that he said that I think must have upset Jesus the most. He said, I brought my son to your disciples, but they couldn't do anything to help me. But they could not. I brought my son to the church, and nothing happened. It is sobering for us to think this morning, as we reflect on this, that the lack of power in our lives, in the lives of Jesus' disciples, reflects on the power of God himself. Paul Gilbert once said this, you and I are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the words that you say and by the deeds that you do. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? How often we are guilty of false advertising. The disciples had knowledge they had experience. They'd done this before, but they were severely lacking in power. And so Jesus says in verse 19, he says, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Can you feel the sting of those words? Jesus could see the real problem. The real problem was not a lack of training or a lack of being relevant or attractive. The problem was this. The man was trying to get help and the disciples were trying to give it all without faith in the God who could do it. And that's why Jesus looks at them and he immediately sums up their problem. He says, oh, faithless generation. They didn't have faith. They were unbelieving. And Spurgeon once said, he said, every other crime touches on God's territory, but unbelief aims a blow at his divinity, impeaches his veracity, denies his goodness, blasphemes his attributes, maligns his character. Therefore, God of all things hates first and chiefly unbelief wherever it is. God has never rewarded unbelief. God has never been able to reward faithlessness. The Gospels tell us that when Jesus walked this earth, he had to pass whole towns by and was unable to work many miracles there because of unbelief in those places. Unbelief kept the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And in the spirit of prophecy, Maranatha, page 19, it is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. And as you listen to Jesus talking to these people, it almost sounds like he's talking to Laodicea, doesn't it? He says, how long must I endure you? And by the way, friends, the problem with Laodicea isn't so much her temperature. That's just a symptom of her disease. Her disease is this self-righteousness. She believes that she's good enough to get by on her own, but friends, we will never be good enough to get by on our own. Amen? We will always need Jesus and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is why the Holy Spirit ever speaks of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is Christocentric, always pointing us to Jesus as our only hope. And Jesus says, bring the boy to me. And I like that. You ought to underline that in your Bible. Because when you have a problem, don't just Facebook it. Give it to Jesus and let him face it. Amen? If the disciples miss the point, don't let them destroy your faith. Take your problem straight to Jesus. Don't try to fix your past, your future, your present, your family, your relationships. Bring it to me is what Jesus says to us. And notice verse 20. 
Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. Verse 22, And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Peter, James, and John, the returning disciples who'd been with Jesus just moments before on the Mount of Transfiguration, cringed at the sight before them. It was very different to what they'd just seen on the Mount. In the presence of Jesus, that demon started to behave like a demon. And the spirit of prophecy tells us that at this moment, the angels of light and darkness were crowding in over this scene to watch as Michael and the dragon met again on the field of battle. And friends, Jesus is such a personal God. Do you realize that this is the only time that Jesus ever asked anybody for a case history of the person he was about to heal? It's the, first, the only time, and I think the reason why he did this was because he saw before him a broken man who needed to tell a sympathizing someone of the bitterness and the pain that had poisoned his home for so many years. Imagine the memories that this question must have resurrected for the father. He remembered the first day those laughing eyes had turned wild. He remembered the first moment of madness the first convulsion. As he speaks, he points to the convulsing body of his son covered in sores and scabs, and his son's face is locked in a, in a horrific grimace of pain, foaming at the mouth. The Bible's description is so vivid, little is left to the imagination. And as these memories flood his mind, finally he, w- he is overcome with grief and he motion that he can bear it no longer and so he makes his earnest plea to Jesus if you can do anything please have compassion on us and help us Satan's plans for your life and mine aren't very different to the plans he had for that boy he wanted to kill that boy and that's exactly what he'd like to see of us as well like to get rid of us But friends, let me tell you that you and I have never looked into the eyes of someone that doesn't matter to Jesus Christ. Amen? We all matter to God. The Father wanted help. Had he come to the right place? Luke chapter 9, verse 56 says, The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. He wanted compassion. Had he come to the right person? Psalms 145 verse 8 says, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. He'd come to the right place. Amen? And friends, the Roman... Well, before I get there, let's read the next verse. Verse 23. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. The Roman military leader Pompey used to boast that with one stamp of his foot, he could rouse all of Italy to arms. But friends, God with one word from his mouth can summon all the angels of heaven and undiscovered worlds to his aid. He's that powerful. Which is why as soon as this man's words are uttered, as soon as he makes his cry to Jesus, Jesus takes his words and he almost hurls them back at him and he says, listen, I have nothing to prove. Look at the record. I called everything out of nothing. I am the great I am. I created this world. The question is not if I can. No, you've put the if in the wrong place. The question is this, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. It was a call to faith in Christ. And somebody gave me a wooden standalone cutout, I hope that explains it, of the word faith. You know, I don't know, you know what I'm talking about? 
I, yeah, wooden standalone cutout of the word faith, and it sits on my bookshelf. And every time I come into my room, sometimes when I'm perplexed or troubled, I will come in and I just happen to look at that bookshelf and I will see that one word sermon preaching back at me, calling me to faith in Jesus Christ, to believe in God and to let go and let God be God because there is no strength greater than the strength of the Lord. The world says, show me and I'll believe. Jesus says, Believe me, and I'll show you. Amen? And come over, just keep your finger in the book of Mark, but come over to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 27. This is another good text. Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 27. Jeremiah 32 verse 27 says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there what? Is there some things too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? Friends, God is big enough to help you with your problems. And yet so many times we are caught making the same mistake as this father. We put the if in the wrong place and we say, if you can help me, if you can save me, if you can forgive me, if you can deliver me, if you can heal me. No, that's not what we ought to be saying. If you can believe, he both can and will. And the man's response is powerful. Verse 24, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. It wasn't that the man didn't think that Jesus could help him. He woke up that morning believing that he could. But friends, sometimes the shield of faith gets heavy. Sometimes believing isn't always easy. It's not easy when you're fighting with that habit. It's not easy when the crowd is telling you not to believe or that it's impossible. It's not easy when circumstances seem to suggest that God is not there, that God is distant. It's not always easy to believe. The disciples had already let him down big time. But to think that his son might continue to suffer on account of his inability to believe in Jesus' ability was more than he could handle, which is why he chooses to take a great leap of faith and lay hold of the one who stood before him. And as soon as he does that, immediately he becomes aware of his weakness, of his own weaknesses, of a great chasm of unbelief behind him, which is why he says with tears, kneeling before the Son of God, O oh Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And friends, tears are a language that God understands. With all its new technologies, the iPod, the iPhone, the iBook, the i-whatever, Apple could never create a response more beautiful. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. This is the victory that overcomes the world. When we are stranded on God and shipwrecked on omnipotence. Amen? It is the courage of this man's faith and able, being able to say this that makes him one of my greatest Bible heroes. Mrs. White, she actually goes so far as to say that when we pray sincerely this prayer, we can never be lost. You know why? Because we are believing. And the Bible says that whoever believes on him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I think of the story of this father. He was reading one afternoon, and his little five-year-old daughter came into his study, and she said, Daddy, can you please build me a dollhouse? And he said, sure, honey. And then off she went, and he kept reading. And as he kept reading, a few moments later, he looked out the window of his study and he saw his five-year-old going into the backyard with an armful of dolls, 
Then she went back to the house and she came out again with an armful of toys. She went back to the house, came out again, an armful of dishes and little plates and cutlery. And he was a bit confused and so he asked his wife, he said, what is she doing? And she said, well, you promised her that you would build her a dollhouse and she believed you. She's just getting ready for you when you are ready to build the, the dollhouse. And it was that moment, at that moment, it suddenly struck him. He dropped everything that he was doing, raced down to the hardware store, bought the necessary materials and came back and built that girl a dollhouse. Why? Because she had believed his word. She had put faith in his word and nothing could keep him from carrying out his promise. And friends, I believe that God wants us to have that kind of childlike faith, to just believe him. When he says that he will do it, believe that he will. And pray, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Because of faith that declares itself publicly, yet realizes its own weakness and pleads for help, is real faith. And friends, Jesus took this man's faith and he worked with it. Verse 25 and 26. When Jesus saw the people come, came, that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and came out of him and he became as one dead so that many said, he is dead. The Prince of Peace gives that vile demon his marching orders and that demon had no choice but to get out and stay out, amen? Casting out demons has never been a problem for Jesus. Satan was cast out of heaven a long time ago. He's a defeated foe. But crowds are really optimistic. And as soon as Jesus delivers this boy, everybody around looks at it and they say, well, he's dead. But Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. Verse 27. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And I just love that because the mighty Redeemer who a few moments before had stood glorified before his wandering disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration now reaches down to lift a poor victim of Satan who is wallowing in the valley. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And by the way, in this text, the word in the Greek for the word lifted here is the same word that also means to raise to life. We find the same word in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, where it says, but if the spirit of him, Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So, question, what is Mark's point? I think it might be this, that it is only through death and resurrection that the works of the evil one are destroyed. And friends, Jesus is still in the lifting business. Amen? He is still able to lift us into new life. I come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. The Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen? Jesus is still able to lift us into newness of life. Story is told of a camp meeting that happened one time, and a man at this camp meeting, he stood up to share his testimony, and as he was sharing his testimony, a heckler in the crowd also stood up, and he said, oh, just sit down and be quiet. You're just dreaming. This isn't true. And after he said that, he felt a little tug on his coat and he looked down and there was a little girl there and she looked up at him and she said, Mister, that man talking over there is my dad. My dad used to be a drunkard. 
He used to spend all his money on whiskey. My mum would cry almost every night, and she was always unhappy. I never used to have nice shoes or anything, but look, I'm wearing nice shoes, and you see this pretty dress? My daddy bought this for me. And you see that lady over there with the big smile on her face? That's my mummy. And she sings now while she's doing the ironing. So if my daddy's dreaming, then please don't wake him up. <laughs> But friends, it's not a dream, amen? God changes lives. I know it because I've seen it happen in my own life. I've seen it happen in the lives of people in my family. My dad, who isn't here, unfortunately, I have my mum and my sister with me here, which is really wonderful. But my dad, he's back home in Sydney, so I can talk about him. My dad, he comes from Samoa. My last name is Fong because his dad was also part Chinese. So I'm all mixed up. And, um, but my dad, as soon as he, well, shortly after he married my mum, he stopped going to church. But you know what? My mum prayed for him, and we prayed for dad for 25 years. And 25 years later, God got a hold of him. The Holy Spirit finally won the victory in his heart, and he was rebaptized. So I know that God changes lives. Some of you may have fathers or mothers or brothers and sisters, loved ones who are not in the church or who don't know Jesus. Keep praying for them because God is still in the lifting business. He's still able to lift that cold, complacent Christian out of their complacency and into blessing. He is still able to deliver that person struggling with, a, with an addiction. He's still able, able to deliver them. He's still able to forgive the sinner burdened with guilt. And he's still able to forgive them even if that sinner is you. Friends, our God is still able. And I imagine as the father as he saw Jesus deliver his son and when for the first time his son looked at him and ran to him and called him dad as he ran to him, I imagine it was the happiest day of their lives. Both of them had come to Jesus and both of them had been healed. The father of his unbelief and the son had been delivered from this demon. The God on the mountaintop had proved he was still God in the valley. Amen. But nine of the disciples were quite confused. They were still puzzled. They couldn't work out what had gone wrong. People saw them as men of faith. Jesus had given them the power to cast out demons. And so in true Laodicean style, though they were completely unaware of their problem, and so they approached Jesus privately, which, by the way, is a privilege that you and I have as well. When we are perplexed, come to Jesus privately. And notice what happens, verse 28 and 29. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. To paraphrase, Jesus looks at them and it's almost like he says, you're not taking God seriously. It's as if you're engaged in a mock battle. It's like you're playing a game or something, but your enemy, Satan, he is much stronger than you are. Meet him alone and he will come out on top every single time. The bottom line is this. You cannot fight. You cannot face him without me. Friends, they were powerless because they were prayerless. And John Wesley, one day when he was riding along, he came across a man who was on his knees, breaking stones, don't know why, with an interesting device. And when he saw him, being the preacher he was, he immediately made a spiritual application. And he said, oh, I wish I could break the hearts of the people who hear me. Some of them, their hearts are as hard as stone. And the man on his knees said, well, have you ever tried breaking them on your knees? This is a heavy-duty point because the disciples, sorry, the scribes, had linked the powerlessness of the disciples to the superior power of the demon. But that wasn't the problem. They were the ones that were lacking in power. It was the disciples that were spiritually powerless. And friends, on our own, we are unable to overcome character flaws. We are unable to overcome temptations and demon possession. 
And yet later in the same chapter that we're in, Mark chapter 9, it's interesting. In verse 38, the disciples came across another person casting out demons. They, this person was doing what they should have been able to do because this person believed in Jesus. And when they saw it, John tells Jesus, he said, we forbade him because he wasn't part of the 12. You see, evidently the disciples had come to believe that power was inherent in them. But you and I cannot inherit God's power. Just because you're here at GYC at a conference called Fill Me, just because we're hearing lovely, powerful sermons and seminars on the Holy Spirit and God doesn't mean that you're automatically going to receive the latter rain. We only receive this as we come to Jesus day by day and establish a relationship, a personal relationship with him. But that wasn't even the only problem. It seems that there was another problem that went even deeper than this. Yes, they were prayerless, and that was a problem. But there was a reason why they were prayerless. And the spirit of prophecy helps us understand what that was. And here's a quote from Desire of Ages. She writes, The selection of the three disciples to accompany Jesus to the mountain had excited the jealousy of the nine. Instead of strengthening their faith by prayer and meditation on the words of Christ, they had been dwelling on their discouragements and personal grievances. They were prayerless because they were preoccupied with self. In a jealous, self-seeking state, they had tried to take on the demons, but instead the demons had taken them on. And in another quote that I, I read from the Spirit of Prophecy, she says, I know of no sins greater in the sight of God than cherishing jealousy and hatred toward brethren and turning the weapons of warfare against them. In October of 1805, the day before the Battle of Trafalgar, Admiral Lord Nelson, he inquired of his Admiral, Admiral Collingwood, he asked him where the captain was, and as soon as he learned where the captain was, he also learned that there was a problem between the captain and Collingwood. And so he sent a boat to bring the captain over to where he was, and the boat brought the captain. And so when the captain, Collingwood, and sorry, the captain was not Collingwood, rather Ham was the captain, and Collingwood was the admiral, when they both came together, these two men obviously had a problem with each other. Lord Nelson, he took both of their hands and he put them together. And then with a sweep of his hand, he motioned to this, the horizon where there were ships gathering for war. And he said, look, yonder, there are your enemies. You and I don't waste time fighting with each other. We're not the enemy. We ought to be family. We're on the same team. We're not the enemy. And friend, as soon as that happened, they dropped their argument and the victory was won. Over and over again in the book of Acts, friends, we see that the early church was of one accord, and we need the same kind of aggressive unity in our churches today. To quote D.L. Moody, there is one thing that we must have if we are to have the Holy Spirit of God work in our midst, and it is unity. Jealousy, criticizing, fault-finding, gossip, all of those things will hinder the work of God's Spirit every time. I think it's time that we left the judgment to God. Amen? Let God be God. To quote again from the Desire of Ages, in order to succeed in such a conflict, they must come to the work in a different spirit. Their faith must be strengthened by fervent prayer and fasting and humiliation of heart. They must be emptied of self and be filled with the spirit and power of God. Earnest, persevering supplication to God in faith. Faith that leads to entire dependence upon God and unreserved consecration to his work can alone avail to bring men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle. Friends, before we go any further, it's time we remembered that one last thing that Jesus said. Before you go, Wait for the Holy Spirit to empower you. 
Come to him. Come to Jesus every morning and pray for it. And when you receive it, then you can go and share with the world around you. I know that it's tempting to be committed to perpetual activity, to just keep go, 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 go. But friends, we need the Holy Spirit's power if we are going to finish this work. Amen? Knowledge of Daniel 11 and 12 is not going to be enough. Activity will not be enough. You and I need Pentecostal power. This is the only hope of the Adventist church. And I'm reminded of what will happen when we receive that power, whenever we ask for it in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the end of the earth. And friends, a great change took place in those disciples. Those disciples that we find here, faithless, a great change took place in them after Calvary. In the upper room before Calvary, they were fault-finding, trying to be the greatest. But in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they're a different bunch of people. They're humble. They're emptying themselves of themselves, of self. They're of one accord. And God marks this with an outpouring of His Spirit. He fills them. What made the difference? Well, I believe that the cross made a lot of difference because the men in the upper room, those in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, had surveyed the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. And because of that, their richest gain, they counted but loss and poured contempt on all their pride. Friends, in each heart, there is a throne and a cross. Sin, self, and the Savior cannot occupy the same heart throne, which means if Jesus is on the throne, self is on the cross. And to quote something from a book I've been reading by Leroy Froome, The Coming of the Comforter, as the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost after the enthronement of Christ in heaven, so it is not until Christ is enthroned king in the individual heart that the personal Pentecost comes. This is our greatest individual need and therefore our greatest collective need as well. If Jesus had remained on this mountaintop, the situation in the valley would have remained unchanged. But friends, God so loved the world that he came to this world, amen? The Son of God became the Son of Man that he might change the sons of men into sons of God. He descended into our valley of great need that, we, that he might die the death that we deserve so that one day he could take us to a better place. I pray as you listen to the song just now and in the prayer time that will follow that you and I will empty ourselves of self. That if there is jealousies that exist in our heart between us and someone else that we will ask God to take it from us. Give it up that we will seek God in prayer so that we can receive his power and finish this work and go home. Amen. May God bless you.
compassion for all the people living and dying without knowing you and having no savior they're lost forever if we don't speak out and lead them to you god you are waiting your heart is breaking for all the people who live on the earth stir us to action Would you bow your heads with me for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we have been taken to your throne, and right now we invite Jesus to come down from the mountain and to take lodging in our hearts. We ask that you would give us faith, and that a faith founded on the Word of God would lead us to unity as your people. We're throwing ourselves at your feet, and we're expecting you to perform that miracle in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.